Let's go to the title is the lamp of the Lord and the small title will be the royal priesthood. And this study stems from Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, our opening verse. It says, the spirit of the man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the innermost parts of his being. When it's dark, we all reach out for flashlight. And our God does the same. When our world is in darkness, his eyes are moving to and fro, looking into the depth of our souls and our spirit to see how bright we are. Those who have a bright soul and a spirit will be held in the right hand of God to be used as his mighty instrument in the time of darkness. When do we need lamp? When it's dark. So we can see that there is a direct relationship between the lamp of the Lord and darkness in this world. So as an introduction, let's define what is the day of the Lord like? Okay. The scripture testifies that the day of the Lord is nighttime. It's darkness. We all want something bright. We all want something that shines. But the scripture says the day of the Lord, the day that we all wait for, will be utter darkness. There's a few verses from the scriptures that tells us that we must prepare for the darkness. Moses says, the coming of the Lord will be in the night. So he called it the night of the Lord. Prophet Amos also said the day of the Lord will be darkness. Prophet Zacharias also said the second coming will take place in the time of darkness and nighttime. Even our Lord Jesus said of this parable, the coming of the groom, the coming of our true groom will be in the dark time, in the midnight. That's why he spoke of the parable of the 10 virgins. Also, Paul, Apostle Paul said, the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Let's go to just one verse, Amos chapter 5, verse 18 through 20. It says, alas, you who are longing for the days of the Lord, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? So what are, you, what are we expecting? And the Bible tells us that it will be darkness and not light. So will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light, even gloom with no brightness in it? That's why Jesus told us to prepare the lamp and oil for his coming, because it will happen in the nighttime, as we saw in the parable of the ten virgins, right? So here we can cap this. Because the day of the Lord will be night, God says he prepared a lamp for his coming for the coming of the Messiah. And that is in Psalm 132, verse 17. This is what God says. There I will cause the horn of David to spring forth, and I have prepared a lamp for mine anointed. Okay. So here, mine anointed is referring to Messiah, right? But I want you to note this word prepared a lamp. This word prepared in Hebrew is this. Arak. It means set in order or it means line up. So when you line up something, so when the lamp is just about to go out, we will replace it with another lamp. So the lamp will never die. So you're lining up the lamp. So you see, lamp is directly related to darkness. The lamp is directly related to the Lord's coming. And God entrusted this duty to Aaron and his sons, whom we know as a high priest. That is explained in Leviticus chapter 24, verse three to four. God says, Aaron shall keep in order, again, Arak, the very word that God used, from evening to morning. You see, it's from evening to morning. This is when it's at the darkest, right? So from evening to morning before the Lord continually, how continually, not just for the days of the ancient Israel history, but it shall be a perpetual statute. Our God who holds all time says it will be a perpetual statute, means for eternity throughout your generations. That means this verse also applies to you and me today. 
Also in Leviticus chapter 24, continuing on to verse 4, he says again, Aaron shall keep the lamps in order. Again, same word, arak. On the pure gold lamp stand before the Lord continually. Until the coming of Jesus Christ. So we can wrap up this history into this diagram form. The Aaron is entrusted with lighting the lamp until the coming of the Messiah to fulfill Psalm 132 verse 17. God is arak, prepared a lamp, keep in line to line up a lamp for God's anointed. So Aaron, from him, there are 77 generations of high priest in the Israelite history. And who are Aaron and his sons? And these 77 generations who keep the lamp burning are same as those lamps. The spirit of man is God's lamp in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, because when they fail, the lamp will fail, right? So Aaron and his sons are the high priests, and not only they are to keep the lamps burning in the tabernacle or the temple of God, besides this, their other exclusive duty relates to our sins. High priests, their role in relations with our sins. So they have the following roles. High priest is very unique from other priests because on the day of atonement, which is on the seventh month in Jewish calendar on this 10th day, when they go into the most holy place and nobody's allowed to enter one day of this year. He will go in there to repent for our sins, not for his sins, not only, not only for his sins only, but for entire people of Israel. Hence, Aaron and his household were like mediators between who? Between God and the entire people of Israel. And this not only reflects only for Israel because God said when he delivered his people from Egypt, right after the Exodus, God proclaims the very purpose of their Exodus is to make them as kingdom of priests. It means God's will for the entire Israel to become his priestly nation. Exodus chapter 19, verse 6 says this, God says, And you shall be to me a kingdom, a priest, and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. God wanted a whole nation to mediate between God and the entire world. And I believe that this is a blessed calling that we, our countries, are represented here at the Hora Seminar, have received. Amen. So now let's go into the history of the 77 high priests. How did they do with how did they do with keeping the lamps in line and burning them brightly? How did they do their job as a mediator between God and the Israelites so that the entire nation can become kingdom of priests to deliver the entire rest of the world? So the 77 high priests, um, this was actually um, systematically presented for the first time in the world history by Dr. Reverend Evan Park in his sixth book, which is upcoming to be printed this year. And it is really amazing. I mean, we don't have enough time to go over every 77 high priests, but their history is so well summarized from the perspective of our redemption through Jesus Christ that I really encourage you to go to the book and read, just delve yourself into the history of these high priests. But one thing I want to mention today is this. However significant their role is, why? Because they're directly related to atonement of our sins, right? Despite this, the high priest has surprisingly low profile in the scriptures. So after the period of settlement, which is like from the judges period, they kind of disappear from the scriptures and they resurface only after the return from the Babylonian captivity. Okay. So let's take a look at the history. We will classify the 77 generations into three categories. First, by the temple, there were 29 priests who can be um, classified according to the temple period. Why? 
because the history of the high priest concurs with the history of the temple. High priesthood is obsolete without the temple. So here they are. First is Solomon's tabernacle, that these um, generations of the high priest. And then comes Solomon's temple. We had the most generations of the high priest here. And then after the return from the Babylonian captivity at the Zerubbabel's temple, these priests uh, ministered in these temples. So there are a total 29 generations and their records can be found here. For the Moses Tabernacle, Solomon's Temple, their names are listed in the Chronicles genealogy in 1 Chronicles chapter 6, also in Ezra chapter 7. Um, for the uh, high priest during the time of Zerubbabel's Temple, they are written in Haggai and Book of Nehemiah. And we see the last priest is Jatua. Then after the time of the Zerubbabel's Temple, the high priest disappeared from the scriptures again. And this period is so-called the intertestamental era. It is also known as a period of darkness because there are no biblical records. And therefore, we need to resort to the most authoritative literature from that time, such as the books of the Maccabees or Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews and the Jewish War. So here are, now this time, this group of the high priests will be classified according to the time period, because there are no temples, right? Um, as mentioned in the scriptures. So we're going to classify them according to the period of time. And here we go. There are total 19 generations, okay? Now, from the Hellenistic period, and so Persia falls and from the Greek, uh, Greek uh, uh, rules, and here we have the Ptolemaic kingdom and we have these following priests. And then comes the Seleucid rule. And during this time, we can note Jason, Menelaus and Alchemist. We're going to go to these priests in more detail later. And then we enter into the Hasmonean era. This is time of Judean independence. So we have these following priests, total 19 generations and their records again, come from Maccabees and the Josephus' literature. And here, these high priests, they gain much power, not only as spiritual leaders, but also in kingship. Okay. So as the Davidic line fails during this time of the dark period, the ever-increasing power goes to the high priest and they do resurface in the scriptures when? In the days of Jesus. So the time gets darker, that's why our screen is much darker than before. This group of high priests, the last category are, are classified by the appointers. Okay. So it starts from 37 BC, 37 years before the coming of Jesus Christ until after, seven years after Jesus Christ. So there are total 29 generations. But Herod the Great, Herod the Archelaus, the Quirinius, the governor of Syria, Gratus, the governor of Judea, Vitellius, the governor of Syria, Herod Agrippa I, Herod the Calchas, Herod Agrippa II, and then the final priest by Phanius, uh, who is Phanius, is casted by the Zealots. Okay. So these high priests total 29 generations we're supposed to keep the lamp burning to prepare the way of the Messiah, right? In this light, the high priests and the priests were the lamps of their nation. When the priests allowed the temple lamps to dim, then the, their nation's lamp also dimmed. Israelite history shows that the priest who obeyed God's word was a lamp that gives life to the period in which they lived. So this is a very crucial lesson to all of us today. But a priest who disobeyed God's word was a lamp gone out and he led his entire period through sin and death. So let's examine this darkness more, the corruption of the high priest. So we're going to look at just a few examples among the 77 generations. First, extremely wicked high priests, Jace, Jason, Menelaus, and Alchemist. 
during the Seleucid king named Antiochus IV. Now, here during the Ptolemaic kingdom, the Onias III, or Onias III, was the last legitimate high priest according to the line of Zadok. Okay, he was a good one. He kept the law well, and he was a very pious high priest. And he says that Jerusalem enjoyed peace under Onias III's reign. Okay. However, when the Antiochus IV, also known as Epiphanes, succeeded the throne, these three, Jason, Menelaus, and Alchemus, they got involved here. Jason is actually Onias' brother, but he bribes Antiochus IV and sees his brother's high priesthood. And then three years later, so Jason rules only for three years as high priest, and then his other brother, Menelaus, comes, and he actually comes and murders Onias, and he steals the high priesthood from Jason. And so the Jews regard Onias III's death as the greatest turning point in the history of the post-exilic period. Remember, God instituted high priesthood only to the line of Aaron. Only Aaron and his sons could become high priest. And therefore, high priesthood could not be established or be abolished by man's will. However, we see here Antiochus IV. He was setting against his holy covenant and replaced the high priest as he wished. And these three high priests got heavily involved in this. Okay. This is a coin of Antiochus IV. He's known as Epiphanes. Epiphanes means God manifest. He severely oppressed Judaism by forbidding all worship, all religious activities, uh, including circumcision, keeping of the Sabbath, and abiding by the law. He went as far as to place the image of Zeus, as we see here. It's known as abomination of desolation, according to Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. So he places the image of Zeus in the temple of God and calls a temple as temple of Zeus. Okay, this is the Antiochus IV. And here, I want you to note this Menelaus. Historian records that he, Menelaus, was not a man who's fit to become a high priest at all. That's the record of history. He's the one who killed his brother Onias III, right? This is what the second Maccabean says. Menelaus did not possess the character befitting a high priest. He had a temperament of a cruel tyrant and the rage of a wild beast. But here comes a really astounding record. Here, this Lysias, he was Antiochus the fifth re regent. So he was the son of Antiochus the fourth. He comes and tells the king that Menelaus was a person who had incited the king's father, the Antioch Antiochus the fourth. He says the Menelaus was the one who forced the Jews to give up their religion of their ancestors and caused a conflict. And so Lysias says that Menelaus is the one to be killed to prevent an uprising of the Jews. This is in Antiquities. It was Antiochus IV who causes great persecution among the believers, right? And defile the temple. But you see, it's so shocking that all the um, wicked deeds of Antiochus IV actually falls on the Jewish high priest Menelaus because he had encouraged the Gentile king's evil acts. What a shameful thing to hear from the Gentiles concerning the high priests. They were supposed to be the one to prepare the way for the Messiah. They were the one to bear the entire nation upon their shoulders and offer up the sacrifices to God for the people. They're the people who to work for the atoning of our sins. Yet these wicked priests betrayed and abused God's name, God's temple, and the nation for their own wealth and honor and power. And because of this, the wicked high priest, the three generation, Jason, Menelaus, and Alchemus, these um, people's legitimacy as high priest was very questionable. And after their time, there came an interlude in the high priesthood. 
and it lasted for seven years from 159 through 152 BC. This was the first interlude in the high priesthood since the time of the Zerubbabel's temple due to the Babylonian captivity. So let's go into the next phase in the history. After the interlude in high priesthood comes the Maccabean revolution and Hasmonean dynasty. Now the Hasmonean dynasty were established by the sons of Maccabees family who had, who had led Judea's revolution for independence. These family, this family rose up to become the ruling dynasty of Judea and succeeded the high priesthood. So there were nine generations of the high priests during this time of Hasmonean dynasty. Okay. So these are the nine priests. They are the ones who fought for the independence of Judea, right? Against the wicked high priest, against the wicked Gentile kings and defiling of the temple, right? But look at the shocking truth of the history. Nevertheless, internal conflict came. During this time, the Judean society was divided into two factions. The Sadducees of the priestly class, uh, they supported the Hellenization, they accepted all the Greek influence. And then they were torn against with the Pharisees who opposed it. And later, this extreme conflict boiled up between the two factions over the throne. And ultimately, in 67 BC, these two sons of the Hasmonean dynasty, Hyrcanus II and Archibius II, they engaged in an intense struggle over the throne. And what was a devastating consequence? Because of their internal fight, they ended up involving Rome in their conflict. And this resulted in the conquest of Jerusalem in 63 BC by the Roman general Pompey. So in 40 BC, Antigonus becomes a high priest and he sees Judea. And so here, Herod the Great he emerges and he goes to Rome and he gets himself appointed as a king. This marks the end of the 126 year Hasmonean dynasty. They were actual descendants of Aaron and thus they preserved the high priesthood. Nevertheless, we must remember they lost their royal authority to Antipater's son Herod, who was of a common family. Why? because of their own internal conflicts. Who's Herod the Great? He was the second son of Antipater. He was descendant of Esau. The name Edom comes from Esau, the Edomites. And also this is the Hebrew form. The Greek form is Edomea. His name means a son of a hero. Okay. But this is a part that I really want you to pay attention to. His marriage. He divorced his wife Doris to marry Hyrcanus II's granddaughter, Mariamne I. Now we saw this name Hyrcanus II, right? Who is this? So I would like you to look at this chart. I, I, it, it seems a very complicated in the beginning, but I think this is like the most beautiful chart, most fabulous chart. Um, and uh, Dr. Abraham Park's book, An Eternal High Priest for the Covenant Oath. This is the sixth book, the upcoming book, and the History Redemption series. Now, let's go to focus on um, this part. This is the Hasmonean dynasty here. This one is the Herodian clan, okay? Let's go from the beginning right here. Starting from Marathias, the first leader of a Maccabean revolt, right? And then here comes the Hasmonean um, high priest, the Simon the third, Jonathan the office, and the John Hyrcanus the first, and blah, 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 right? And here we see Hyrcanus the second here. And then in how Aristobulus the second, they always fought so much. So we can see he was a sixth generation and then comes a seventh generation. And then Hyrcanus the second takes the office again. You can see the conflict and the uh, the power struggle between the two. Now, Hyrcanus II, okay, 
actually was friend with who? Antipater here, the father of Herod the Great. And their devastating consequence of the friendship was this. The marriage between Miriamne the first and Herod the Great, the son of Antipater. Miriamne. Okay. So here we see in um, 40 42nd BC, they get engaged and then they get married in 37 BC. In the same year, the Roman forces seize Jerusalem, and therefore Herod the Great becomes a king of the Jews. So Herod, after he marries Miriam the first, what he does is he ends up killing Aristobulus the third, the last royal descendant of the Hasmonean dynasty, and marks the end. I call it, I call this chart as manifestation of man-made royal priesthood. Here on the left side, we have priest. On the right side, we have the king. Okay. And note what happens between the marriage between these, the priest and kings. You see Herod Agrippa the first. This is the most notorious enemy of the Christians and also Herod Agrippa II. They came from Hasmonean dynasty here, mixed with the Herodian clan. You see how dark this time was? The priests were supposed to prepare for the coming of Jesus, that they defiled themselves by being married into the human greed. And this was such a dark time, and this was precisely when Jesus, our promised Messiah, was born. So the Bible sums up the time which Jesus was born as in the days of the Herod the king. So for more than 100, 100 years, from the death of Herod great until the 70 AD when um, the, uh, when the uh, Israel falls by Rome, the people of Judea were on the rule of this Herodian dynasty. Okay, they appointed the high priest during this period. So they are as follows. From here, Herod the Great, his successors point, appoint 27 high priests, starting with Ananel. He mean, his name means from Babylon. Okay, here we go. We saw this before. These high priests were extremely corrupt and they were under the protection of the political power. They were not able to perform priestly duties independently either, even though they were the high priest. Moreover, there were no sign of purity or godliness as religious leaders in them. Okay. So here we can see how Herod the Great completely tears down the legitimacy of the true high priesthood. So I want to actually focus on the days of Jesus in this chart. We'll be here. See here, 4 BC is when Jesus is born, and here is when Jesus is crucified here. And so during the time of Herod Archelaus and Quirinius, the government of Syria, and Gratus, the government of Judea, we see high, pri high priest name Annas and also Joseph Caiaphas. Around AD 29, after Jesus was arrested, Jesus received his first interrogation from here, Annas, okay? You can see that although his office ended long time ago before the time of Jesus's crucifixion, he continued to exercise great influence as he established his sons as high priest. So even at this time, Annas was still called the high priest at this time. Let's check the scriptures. John chapter 18, verse 12 to 14 says, the Romans seized Jesus and bound him and led him to whom first? Annas first. For he was father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. And now who is Caiaphas? Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man, means Jesus, to die on behalf of the people. Okay. And that after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, 
the chief priests and the elders will yeah. gather together in the court of the high priest named, again, Caiaphas. This is the record in Matthew chapter 26, verse 3. And then, now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain not even true testimony, false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. Here, the whole council is referring to um, Sanhedrin. And Caiaphas, being the high priest at the time, was the official leader of the Sanhedrin. The death sentence of Jesus Christ came from none other than the decision of the Sanhedrin led by the high priest, the very high priest, who are to prepare the coming of the Messiah. They killed the true king, the true high priest, Jesus. So can you imagine when the high priests were so dark like this, what would happen to their nation? So let's go to the final high priest in time of such darkness, Phanias. He was chosen by the rebels called the Zealots. And I thought this cartoon explained Zealots pretty well, so I put it here. They were totally against the Roman power. They were protesting, demonstrating every day to fight off Romans from their territory. Phanias okay. was a final high priest of Judea. He was not from a high priestly family, but rather chosen by this group, Zealots. The Zealots had sought the authority to appoint the high priest but they are very crafty because they imitated the way that David, the king, had chosen the 24 divisions, which he had done by lot, right? So they cast a lot again. And this was a display of extreme corruption of the Jews during those times. Wanting the high priest to become an accomplice to their deeds, to their goal, to their purpose, the zealots broke the tradition, the God, the God-given divine tradition of the law and appointed the priest as they pleased. Here, cast by zealots, Phanias. This ludicrous ending was a clear manifestation of a long period of corruption in the high priesthood. The people stubbornly cast lots to choose a high priest for themselves, however, their new high priest, Phanias, was not only logically unworthy of the high priesthood, but he did not even know what the high priest was. Just as a clown gets dressed up before going on stage, the Jews clothed Phanias with the high priestly garment and instructed him like a puppet what he, what he can do in each process of the sacrifice. The record says they enjoyed the sacrifice worship as if acting a play upon a stage. The sacred dignity of the high priest was completely dissolved and sacrifices became a spectacle and a joke. Can you imagine how this broke the heart of God who instituted high priesthood for our sake? Some record says this, some priests standing at a distance could not contain their flowing tears as they watched Phanias performing the sacrifices they sorely lamented as they watched the ritual and proceedings of the holy sacrifices turn into a spectacle. Josephus wrote, no one, not even a king could become a high priest if he was not of the Aaronic line. And Josephus did not write any further of Phanias. Brothers and sisters, this leads to questions. What is the essence of the high priesthood? What was their fight for? Even if you were for independence from foreign powers, some built, some tore down, some fought bravely, some stole, whether for good or wrong causes, they dedicated themselves for their purposes. But all of this boiled down to what? Our human frailty and powerlessness to sin. This is what the 77 generations of the high priest prove through the history. The history of the high priest proved Romans chapter 3 verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And therefore the scriptures urge us 
to turn our eyes to the true priest, our Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. So let's go on to who our Jesus Christ, true high priest is. He's a true king and his true priest. The background starts with how the chief priest tried to kill Jesus Christ. And I want you to turn to Luke chapter 23. And we're going to read down. Pilate summoned the chief priest, right? And then Pilate did not want to kill Jesus in the beginning, but he pronounced sentence that their demand be granted. Who's their demand? The chief priest, like the Annas and Caiaphas, who persuaded everybody to kill Jesus. They were asking for this. And they he delivered Jesus to whose will? To their will. Whose will? the high priest will. But look at our Lord Jesus, the true king priest. Even though the, these fake priests were trying to kill him, what did Jesus do in the same chapter? But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Our true high priest was focused only on the forgiveness of our sins. His focus was take away our sins so that we are able to enter our God's presence to the bosom of our Father, to the most holy place. Luke chapter 23, verse 44, the same chapter says now, when Jesus, and it was now about the sixth hour and darkness fell over the whole land, the peak of darkness until the ninth hour. And what happened? The veil of the temple was torn into two. So he opened the new living way to the most holy place. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 20 says, Brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, which is a new and a living way, he inaugurated for us through the veil, which is his flesh. So as we enter into this new living way, brothers and sisters, Jesus has guided us to the order, the true high priesthood to the order of Melchizedek. Also in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 through 20 says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has run as forerunner for us to become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. You see, Jesus entered as a forerunner for us. Jesus opened the order of Melchizedek. For whom? To us. Uh, hence, there is emergence of a new priestly line according to the order of Melchizedek. And Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14 through 7 talks about how Jesus, is, although he's from the tribe of Judah, where there's no reference about a priest, he opened the line of another priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay. So what should we do now as we enter the priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek? We can learn this from the first coming as we are preparing for the second coming. So let us go meet John the Baptist. What is truly amazing is how God worked even during this time of utter darkness. You see, while the corruption and the wickedness of the false high priest were reaching its climax, God's redemptive administration was working continuously to preserve the 24 divisions of priests until the time of Jesus to fulfill his word. Luke chapter one, verse five speaks of Zechariah, but <clears throat> look how it starts with, in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. It's one of the 24 divisions that David established. He and his, and his wife was from Aaron's family and her name was Elizabeth and they were both righteous in the sight of God. And here Zechariah receives the news that on this day when he went into the temple to minister that he will have a son who will be the John the Baptist. And then after receiving this 
vision, here John um, uh, Zechariah says this. Bless the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us and the house of David. And this is very, uh, it reminds us of Psalm 132, verse 17, where God says, I will cause a horn of David to spring forth, and I have prepared a lamp for mine anointed. And here comes the emergence of John the Baptist for this purpose. But look at this. Into what kind of period did John the Baptist emerge? Luke chapter 3, verse 1 through 3, list all the names of people in the authority at the time. The, um, Tiberius to Caesar, in the region of Tiberius, Caesar was there. This Pontius Pilate was a governor. Herod was Tetrarch, and his brother was also Tetrarch, and Lysanias, okay? And the high priest was Annas and Caiaphas. In times of like this, John the Baptist, the son of Zacharias, the son of priest, he emerges. And what does he do? He preaches baptism, different form of sacrifice. It's no more a burning sacrifice, no more blood. It's baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. You see this great contrast to point out the true priesthood to prepare the way of the coming of the Lord. So here, John the Baptist's mission is the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The angel says to give his people the knowledge what kind of knowledge? Of salvation. How? By the forgiveness of sins. See, again, God is focused on forgiving of our sins. And this shows that the original duty of the high priest is to prepare the way or the people of the Lord. As we see in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, John the Baptist will come in the spirit and power of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And I believe this is our mission. So in conclusion, the coming of the Lord will be in utter darkness. And we learned from the history of the 77 generations of the high priest that it was a priest who prepared his coming by burning the lambs continually. Then what are our missions today as Christians? Jesus made us priests according to the order of Melchizedek. Again, the word order is taxis in Greek. It means line up like Arak. Only those born of Aaron could become the high priest, right? But Jesus came and established this new line of priesthood. And we are born of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is a true high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So brothers and sisters, we are priests according to the order of Melchizedek, not according to the order of Aaron. Order of Aaron served for they were stewards of the old covenant. The order of Melchizedek were the stewards, are the stewards of the new covenant. What is new covenant? God says, I will put my law within them and on their heart and I will write, and for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. The stewards of the new covenant are to be today's Christian's mission. And Jesus Christ gave us his Holy Spirit for this very purpose. After resurrection, Jesus said in John chapter 20, verse 21 through 23, peace be with you. As a father has sent me, as God the Father sent Jesus, he says, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And what does he say? If you forgive, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. Brothers and sisters, let us truly appreciate and use this power and authority that our Lord Jesus Christ gave us through his Holy Spirit. Purpose of receiving the Holy Spirit reflects the high priesthood of Melchizedek. Why? 
because that's what his name means. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 1 explains, Melchizedek is a king of Salem. He was also king and the priest of Most High God. And his name translates king of righteousness. Righteousness means no sin, without sin. So you're being put in the right relationship with God. That's his ministry. And also king of Salem, king of peace. That's exactly what Jesus gave us as we read in John. Through the Holy Spirit. This is what God calls us to be. And so he says, you are a chosen race. You are a royal priest, king and priest, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is a true kingship and priesthood. So I'll, it's briefly, uh, let us think more about what shining light really means. Okay, This marvelous light, what's proclaiming light? It directly re relates to remission of our sins. Here, this is how we must shine, right? How bulb shines. So we can make analogy like this. This bulb is our body, right? And the electricity that runs through is Holy Spirit. Now the word of Jesus Christ is much more brighter than the word from the long time ago, right? The law of Jesus is much brighter than the old law, right? And so here, our electricity is so much, it's like the LED level, it's not a candle level, okay? But I want you to note this. So what is then our soul? Our body and our, the spirit is our father's spirit that we receive. And the more spirit that we receive from father, what would happen? The light, the brightness comes from our soul. So we, our body must shine through the light of our soul. But let's think about this. What happens when the light is really bright? Brighter the light, the more we see. Not only the good things, but also more flaws that we will see. The brighter we shine, the more flaws of one another we will see. Nevertheless, we must keep on brightening one another's soul by sympathizing with our weaknesses like Jesus did for us. So Jesus gives us the great commission, and I believe this is the royal priesthood. Let's read this together. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, Jesus says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, again, like to John the Baptist, right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of age. So likewise, like the lamp, baptizing. Let's say we are in a big bathhouse. To get bathed in the bathhouse until the time we come out with the clean clothes, we have to endure these steps, brothers and sisters. First, we have to put up with each other's nakedness when you go to bathhouse, right? Yes, we do. And secondly, we must help each other cleanse our impurities, our weaknesses and frailties by pouring water upon one another. And third, let us help one another put on the new robe, Jesus Christ. For baptism in Jesus Christ, Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 says, is clothing ourselves with Christ Jesus. Hence, we are preparing new generation of royal priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek. And I pray that we will burn our lamps brightly in this time of darkness and prepare the way of the returning of the Lord. Let's read our final verse. Hebrews chapter nine, verse 28 says, so Christ also having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear the second time for salvation without reference to sin, to those who eagerly await him. Amen. Let us become the lamp burning brightly in time of darkness so that we can truly prepare the way of his coming. 
Let us help one another so that we can resolve this problem of sin, which our Lord Jesus has already resolved on the cross. Let's spread this good news and burn brightly evermore. Amen. Let us pray. I don't know how to end this. Oh. Okay, let us pray. Our Father God, thank you for gathering all these different countries and their spiritual leaders to come forth and spend this precious time learning about Israeli history, especially the 77 generations of the high priest. Father, we pray that no matter which country we are from, we pray that all the nations become your priestly nations. As your eyes move to and fro in this time of darkness, Father, we pray that our heart will be completely yours and burn brightly as your lamp, like the bright LED lights, so that we can shine upon this darkness. Father, as you have given us this great commission of baptism, help us not to be just abhorred by each other's frailties and flaws and sins. But let us be the ones to cover one another, to cleanse one another and cheer up one another so we can be cleansed and be put on Jesus Christ and to cover our nakedness so that together we can multiply your royal priestly race according to Melchizedek in this time of darkness. Father, we thank you for bringing us to this calling. In Jesus' most precious name we pray, amen. Let's give all the glory to our Father God. We thank you so much for listening.